Good afternoon. This is Andrew Bluestein from Garfunkel Wild, and I'm here with my partner extraordinaire, Peter Hoffman. I want to thank everyone for attending. We had a uh, very large participation um, sign up, and we, we appreciate it. Uh, the audience is made up of uh, mostly people who work in hospitals in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. So we uh, are very thankful for the geographic distribution. Uh, and it, I think, speaks to the fact that uh, the new safe harbor, uh, which uh, allows um, hospitals, as well as other uh, eligible entities, which we'll talk about, uh, allows them to offer free or discounted um, transportation. So it's a, it's a great topic because it has real uh, practical and competitive uh, opportunities. And so what we're going to uh, be taking everyone through, uh, and if you're following your slides, we're, we're moving on. We're trying to move on. Here we go. Okay. Um, we're looking at the agenda, which is on slide three. And by the way, at the end of this, what we're going to uh, ask you is uh, to put your questions in. You can actually put them in now um, as we go through it. So if you think of it, um, in prior sessions, we have not gotten to every question that is asked. We will give it our best shot. Um, and if you need to call Peter and I afterwards, that's fine. Um, we're going to start out uh, with a quick commercial about Garfunkel Wild. Don't worry, it'll be quick. Um, and then we're going to, uh, Peter's going to take you through the history of the transportation issue. It is extremely important to understand the history because, uh, as with most uh, regulations, there's interpretive issues and things like that. And we're leaning back on the past to try to understand exactly what the government was thinking and really what happened in the past yeah, is what gave birth to this in, in large part to this new safe harbor. Uh, we're then going to get into what the safe harbor is. We're going to talk about how this relates to hospitals in specific and what next steps there are. Uh, I know a, a lot of hospitals, including many are on this uh, 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 webinar, are forming committees and getting discussions going with the right people, which will include the CFOs for sure. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take your questions. Like I said, we uh, are going to have a hard stop at one because I know everyone's running around. And so feel free to call Peter and I. Our contact information is, uh, is at the end. Uh, I'll do the commercial and then turn it over to Peter. So uh, everyone on the call knows our firm because we wouldn't be on the, far, wouldn't be on the phone unless we sent it, uh, send you uh, an invitation. Um, we're great. That's the end of the commercial. Um, but we have uh, a very um, diverse group, especially in compliance, which Peter heads up. And uh, we can help you with all the needs to implement uh, a transportation program that complies with this new um, safe harbor. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to spend just a brief amount of time going through the history of the transportation issue from the uh, federal government's perspective in particular. Uh, as Andrew alluded to, uh, th this is important for two reasons. One, it lays out a framework uh, for what you will see in the safe harbor, which was um, became effective in January of this year. Uh, and two, uh, as many of you know, um, if you are not in compliance with the safe harbor, at least under the anti-kickback statute, that does not mean that you have per se violated the law. And so some of the historical things we're going to go through, including some of the advisory opinions, still have credence to the extent, to the extent that you're setting up a program or free or discounted local transportation that may not fit squarely within uh, the safe harbor requirements. 
So let's take a look first at some of the laws uh, that apply when you're considering free transportation. Uh, there are two main ones that I want to talk about this morning. Uh, the first is uh, the federal anti-kickback statute. Uh, and as many of you know already, uh, this is a very broad law, and it is a criminal statute that, among other things, prohibits uh, the knowing and willful solicitation, receipt, offer, or payment of any remuneration that's meant to induce or reward referrals for services or items that are payable in any way under a federal health care program. And of course, the major federal health care programs that many institutions, including hospitals, deal with are Medicare and uh, Medicaid. Uh, the reason that compliance with the AKS is very uh, important is there's just a whole myriad of penalties and liabilities that attach if you violate the law. Uh, this slide here, slide 7, gives you a sense of the significance of those penalties. There are, for instance, criminal penalties for violating the kickback statute up to $25,000 in fines and or up to imprisonment of five years. You can also, in addition, occur, incur civil penalties under the Federal False Claims Act because a violation of the kickback statute also creates liability under the FCA. Uh, and that can result in travel damages and real significant per claim penalties. The amounts are a little bit odd if you're looking at slide 7, slightly less than 11,000 uh, on the low side and slightly less than 22,000 on the high side. And that's due to the fact uh, that there's been recent inflationary adjustments to those amounts. In addition, a kickback violation can result in administrative penalties under the federal civil monetary penalties law, what we call the CMPL. And again, you can see the penalties are quite significant, up to just shy of $75,000 for each instance. Again, treble damages um, and possible exclusion from federal and state health care programs, which for hospitals in particular really is something that they can't uh, stomach uh, for understandable reasons. Now, as you probably know, the anti-kickback statute itself is quite broad, and as a result, it captures many arrangements, such as offering free transportation. Uh, the way it captures free transportation, at least technically, is that the transportation itself acts as the remuneration, uh, which, if offered to induce or reward referrals, whether to a patient or to another provider, can implicate the statute, depending on the, uh, who the, the patient involved is. And because of that, there are both statutory exceptions and safe harbors that uh, protect certain very specifically defined arrangements uh, that the government has looked at and deemed to have uh, minimal potential for abuse uh, or uh, harm to federal health care programs. Um, the takeaway here, and, and we'll get to the actual safe harbor in a few minutes, the takeaway here for the safe harbor though, and for all safe harbors, is that if you're looking to be protected under the safe harbor, you have to meet every single element of the applicable safe harbor squarely. If you're close, that's not good enough. Um, you will not receive the protection of the safe harbor if you hit four out of five or seven out of eight elements. Uh, another statute implicated by the provision on free or discounted transportation potentially uh, is called the beneficiary inducements provision of the civil monetary penalties law. Essentially, this law prohibits any person from giving remuneration uh, to any person who's a Medicare or state health care program, such as a Medicaid patient, if the person knows or should know 
that the remuneration will influence the patient to get the services from a particular provider, practitioner, or supplier, and it's reimbursable under a federal health care program, again, Medicare or Medicaid. What does that mean in the context of transportation? If you go out and you say to Medicare or Medicaid patients, we have transportation services come to our facility. That technically implicates this law because you're offering remuneration in the form of the transportation, and it could be viewed as an inducement to that patient to select you as the provider of service. Now, unlike the anti-kickback law, the beneficiary inducements provision of the CMPL is not a criminal statute. It's a, a civil statute. And what that means is it is enough if you should know that the remuneration is likely to influence the patient's choice. You do not need a specific intent to violate the law. Uh, on the other hand, the kickback statute is a, as I mentioned, a criminal statute, and it does require an intent element. So there is this difference, two laws, they can cover the same conduct, but there are differences between them. And again, on slide 10, you can see that the penalties are quite extensive, um, so that these are real serious issues. There's significant uh, per claim penalties, there's trouble damages or trouble assessments for violating the CPM. Uh, CMPL, and again, exclusion, which is often a death knell for providers from uh, what may often be the lifeblood of, of uh, uh, their finances, uh, which is Medicare and Medicaid uh, and other federal health care programs. Now, the transportation issue is nothing new. Uh, although the safe harbor that Andrew is going to talk about in a few minutes only became effective in January of this year, this is really an issue that the government has deal, been dealing with for 15 or 20 years. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the things that they've talked about in the past. As far back as 2002, um, the OIG issued a special advisory bulletin. And part of that bulletin was talking about nominal value. The reason they were talking about nominal value is that when Congress issued the Civil Monetary Penalties Law, they made a clear expression in their commentary saying, we don't intend for inexpensive or nominal gifts to be included within the beneficiary inducements prohibition under the CMPL. This bulletin, all the way back in 2002, was the first to define what that meant. And OIG said, look, here's what we mean by nominal value. A retail value of no more than $10 in an individual in instance or $50 in the aggregate per patient per year. Again, let's tie that back to transportation. If you think about local transportation services, it's certainly possible that a ride to a hospital could cost $10 or less or less than $10 in an individual instance. So providers would look at this and say, you know, maybe we're not going to invoke the CMPL uh, if the cost uh, is, quote, nominal. Um, however, and we'll mention as an aside, even if you fell into that, you still technically would have a kickback issue. Uh, just six months ago in December, of 2016, the OIG increased these amounts for the first time to $15 in an individual instance and $75 uh, aggregate per patient per year. So that's still out there. Uh, and at that time, back in 2002, the OIG started saying, we're looking at a regulation. We may try to figure out a regulation to allow certain free uh, local transportation that goes beyond our definition of nominal value uh, to federal program patients based on whether uh, it's being offered in the primary catchment area of uh, the provider. Um, 
one thing to note as we start to see the framework that OIG builds over the years, they also said, and it's not on your slide, we're not going to cover anything that's offered in a luxury transportation format. Uh, no limos, no ambulance, those were taboo as far back as 15 years ago. Six months later, in, in December of 2002, the OIG actually acknowledged that this nominal uh, definition could apply to transportation services, and they said, we're still looking at regs, and until we decide to do so, we're not going to impose sanctions under the beneficiary inducements provision uh, if a transportation program by a hospital was in existence prior to the end of August 2002 and met uh, certain requirements. And those requirements included things that you'll hear more of as we go through the presentation. No cost shifting to federal program, uh, uh, to federal health care programs. No using ambulances for the transportation. A distance limit, which at the time was linked to the hospital's primary service area and certain other aspects uh, as well. Now, in addition to that guidance, uh, the OIG, uh, prior to the safe harbor, uh, made available, and they continue to do so today, an advisory opinion process. Uh, as many of you know, the advisory opinion process is applicable only to the entity requesting the advisory opinion. It's supposed to be non-precedential. But the fact is that it's often used as guidance uh, to those who don't fit within a particular safe harbor. And in uh, the uh, advisory opinions that they issued, the OIG looked at things that they typically looked at. So in the context of transportation, if you look at slide 14, they were trying to balance concerns. They were saying, look, we recognize that in some cases, transportation can have a beneficial effect on patient care and is worthwhile. They were looking at things like financial need of the patient, the availability of transportation to get to healthcare providers, the need to get to the providers to ensure patient safety or treatment compliance. And on the other hand, they were looking at their typical fraudulent and abuse concerns, fraud and abuse concerns, uh, things like overutilization, was transportation encouraging overutilization? Were patients, and in particular, federal health care program patients, being steered to receive services, particularly services of questionable, questionable medical necessity? Were the services offered to certain targeted populations? That is, not just federal program patients, but federal program patients receiving services that reimbursed the most. And of course, anti-competitiveness, the balance between the advantages that larger providers, larger healthcare systems may have uh, over their smaller competitors. So if you look back historically, uh, as, back, as far as 2000, the OIG started to lay out kind of the do's and don'ts of transportation. And one of the things they laid out was, let's take a look at things that they cited very specifically as taboo, things that they viewed as potentially abusive. And we can cull from this certain things that you'll see when we get into the safe harbor. So here's some examples. A psych facility who offered out-of-state patients airline tickets to Florida to get services at their, their facilities. And what they're looking at there is the type or mode of transportation. And they're saying, airline tickets goes a little too far for our taste. Another one, for example, fan, uh, van drivers, excuse me, uh, who were offering Medicaid patients, uh, soliciting Medicaid patients rides, and the, the drivers themselves were being paid on a per patient or per service basis. And the concern there is, you know, who are you offering the services to and what's the incentive to get into the van? If the drivers are being paid for every patient they pick up, the OIG viewed that as that crosses the line. That's really not what we're looking for. That more falls in the category of rounding up patients 
uh, to receive services, perhaps of questionable medical necessity. Which you can see here in the top uh, bullet point on slide 16, again, offering free transportation services to or from offices of what the OIG called, quote, unscrupulous providers, and no, they did not define that term. Uh, uh, but really the focus here was the services were of questionable necessity. And that again becomes a theme that we'll see throughout. They returned to hospitals and they said, we've seen hospitals offering limo rides. That goes beyond the pale in their, in their view. And ambulance services not based on need. If we get a little more detailed and go into what they actually looked at for the advisory opinions, you'll see a really clear framework for what's to come in the safe harbor itself when it was finally issued uh, and effectively beginning of this year. The seminal advisory opinion was issued back in 2007. And it had to do with hospitals offering transportation to patients who were receiving extended courses of, you know, had been diagnosed with really serious illnesses chemotherapy, dialysis, radiation therapy. And what OIG did is they laid out this framework. They said, we're going to look at a whole bunch of uh, different things. And as we look at those things, um, uh, we as lawyers would draw a framework from it to analyze clients who came to us. Here's some of the things they looked at. Who were you offering the services to? Federal patients. What type of transportation? Again, that issue. Are you using limos or air or luxury? Uh, where are you offering it? How far are you going? Are you marketing or ad advertising? Are you using it to cross-sell services? These are things they don't like. Uh, are you shifting costs that you incur as the provider onto a federal program? And you'll see this come up repeatedly, and you'll see it uh, later this morning. Uh, Similar examples come up over the years. I've listed several of them on the next couple of pages. A uh, network of pediatric charity care hospitals looking to provide services. One of the additions here is they're looking at things that promote access to care and low risk of harm to patients. Again, focusing on no advertising, no marketing, no cross-selling hospital programs, no cost shifting. Couple more and then we'll get to the safe harbor itself. Uh, the hospital, there's one in 2011 where the hospital was transporting patients who couldn't transport themselves from physician offices on the campus to the hospital to get treatment. And the OIG said, okay, in this particular case, we're not going to impose sanctions. And here's a unique thing that they looked at, I think for the, one of the first times, there was a written policy, and the policy made clear we're not going to focus solely on federal health care program beneficiaries. We're not going to abuse programs like Medicare and Medicaid. They looked at the type of vehicle. They looked at how far the transportation was. They again looked at lack of cost shifting. And one more I'll mention was in 2015. The reason I added this one to the slide is because it, because it talks about a shuttle service, which does make its way into the safe harbor. And once again, the OIG came back to the framework we see and said, we're not going to impose sanctions. And the things they looked at is, again, the type of transportation, no air, no luxury, no ambulance, not paying the van drivers on a per patient transported basis. No marketing and advertising. Uh, the circuit itself for the shuttle was limited. In this case, it ran no more than 18 miles. And no cost shifting, among other things. So these factors that you see keep coming up over and over are what you're going to see as I turn over the program to Andrew to talk about the actual safe harbor. Again, I want to underscore a point that was made earlier, though. It's always important to try to fit within the safe harbor. However, the fact that you do not fit squarely within every element in the safe harbor means two things. One, it means you do not get the protection from the AKS or from the civil monetary penalties law. However, 
particularly on the AKS side, which is an intent-driven statute, it does not mean that there's a per se violation. So the types of things that the OIG has looked at historically, which we can see in the safe harbor, also can continue to maintain vitality and relevance today. So with that said, let's get into the safe harbor itself, and I'll turn the program over to my partner, Andrew Bluestein, to take you through that. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so if uh, you were listening to Peter, you probably came away with the, the concern that you could get into big trouble um, if we violate both the anti-kickback law and the federal civil monetary penalty law. The government is saying, if you come into this bunker, this safe harbor, neither of those things can hurt you. Now, before we start, and we're seeing a lot of hospitals really, and this is a theme I'm going to talk about, really express their creativity. There's a lot of different things you can do in this safe harbor. Um, but one of the things I, I'm thinking is getting lost in the discussion is it's free or discounted. So when, uh, for example, the lawyers on the phone come up with an idea, they go to the CFOs in, in, in their hospitals, and the CFO starts seeing what it's going to cost, um, you got to remember that you don't have to give 100% of the transportation. You could do less. Okay. So this uh, safe harbor was effective this past January. Um, and there's really two separate roads that you can walk down with the safe harbor. And, and credit goes to really Peter for carefully uh, um, describing uh, in these slides that he helped create the two different avenues. One is giving transportation to a patient as an individual. The second one is the shuttle service, and Peter talked about uh, in the past there were some opinions about that. Let's talk about the first one. So that's you can offer the free or discounted uh, transportation if you're an eligible entity. If you're a hospital, you're an eligible entity, so that's easy. And you can offer it to uh, federal health care program beneficiaries who are established patients. Okay, So if you're keeping track, circle eligible entity, we'll come back to it, and circle established patients. Now let's say you wanted to offer this to non-patients. Can you? Well, not if you go under the first road, but under the second one, if you're an eligible entity, you can do that via a shuttle service. So as we're going through this now, ask yourself which road we're on. We're first going to start with the individual uh, transportation. I think of it as uh, setting a cab to pick somebody up, but it's, it's broader than that. Okay. The federal health care program, so to this audience, you can realize that's largely Medicare, Medicaid, but it picks up TRICARE and VA programs and, and, and other things like that. But I want to take this opportunity to point out another thing, which I think is getting confused in the discussions out there among hospitals. This safe harbor covers federal health care programs. It doesn't cover uh, workers' comp, no fault, and whether there's a payer policy about that. We could have a separate discussion about that. Time doesn't permit it, but I just want to highlight to you that uh, in various states, for example, workers' comp programs could take different, um, uh, different views of that. Okay. Eligible entity. Again, this webinar is for hospitals. Um, hospitals are going to clearly fit in. Uh, what is not included in there are pharmacies and DME suppliers and places like that that primarily supply healthcare items. The thought when you read and you, you see this in other contexts, the government thinks that there's a higher chance of abuse if these um, uh, suppliers um, were to furnish the um, transportation. So if your DME comes over to you and says, hey, we'll take care of the transportation burden, um, you now know to tell them to leave. Okay. Established patient. 
So Peter and I think this is a fascinating uh, definition that the government came up with because they really, I think, understood how healthcare works. The phrases or the, the words established patient, if you thought about it, it would mean somebody that you're actually treating. That's not what the definition uh, is meant to do. It is anyone who has selected and initiated contact to schedule an appointment. So let's say I call up a hospital and I make an appointment to come in for an outpatient procedure. I've never stepped, stepped foot in the hospital. Maybe I just went to my doctor's office down the road. Uh, I have never in my whole life given them any information. That's okay. I'm an established person because I selected ABC Hospital and I initiated contact to schedule an appointment. Now, the reason why we think that's a great definition is, so let's say I say, okay, I'm going in for my procedure on Friday. So I'm going to potentially, if the hospital offers it, want to get picked up to take me from my house to the hospital. And if, it, if, if the definition wasn't loose enough, that would not be permitted. Okay. Another uh, area that um, I think the government is recognizing the changing times is that we have a lot of integrated entities. I know there's many hospitals uh, on the phone that have a lot of different uh, system type integrations. They recognize, let's take an ACO. An ACO can actually provide the transportation, but there's a big but, okay? If the AC, let's say there's two hospitals, three hospitals and an ACO, the, each of the hospitals has to bear their cost um, back to the ACO. Um, and so it's not free reign. They have to um, account for those costs. And we're going to talk a little bit more about costs uh, in a bit. Okay. So here's the safe harbor in one sentence. Free or discounted, we now know that there's both local transportation. Have not yet talked about what local means we're going to. To an eligible entity, we have talked about that. Two federal health care program beneficiaries. Now remember, there's two roads. Right now we're on the road of providing individual non-shuttle type transportation. Okay. By the way, if you're listening and you have questions as we're doing this, you don't have to wait to the end to, to put them out there. Okay. Now, when you come up with a policy and for this uh, transportation for patients specifically, you have to have a policy, okay? And that policy has to be uniformly and consistently applied. You can't say, we're gonna have it for this type of patient, and we'll talk about it, and then vary from it, okay? Um, now, we're gonna say something inconsistent, which for lawyers uh, it seems to be second nature, but the regulations say you're not required to maintain documentation. And that's great for, and I know we have a number of them, for the compliance officers on the phone, not having to maintain documentation um, is great. We're going to contradict that and tell you that we actually think you should have some documentation because if we're trying to prove that we followed our policy uniformly and consistently, how do we do that without something? So a call sheet that shows I'm uh, making this up, and again, this this particular safe harbor, you can go a lot of different ways with. But a call sheet which shows the patients who were picked up and why they um, satisfied the policy of the hospital would be good documentation. Okay. Now, the policy can, when you're deciding the policy, who's going to be covered? There's a lot of different ways you can go. The examples that are on your slide 28 are not necessarily the greatest examples, but they're the examples that are listed in the commentary, okay? Let's look at the first one. Eligible entity, again, the hospital, asks any patient who schedules a procedure that inhibits their ability to drive whether they need local transportation. So let's go to the example I started with. You have an outpatient surgery center in your hospital right? Um, everyone who's coming there, assuming, let's assume for the sake of most people coming there, are going to be getting anesthesia. So 
is that, and when they come out, are they going to be able to drive themselves home? Probably not. So that would open up a huge swath of people that you could include in this policy. Realize that's expensive, and remember my comment about the CFO, okay? They also said, this is an example, which I don't quite understand, to be honest. I don't understand the reasoning. The hospital can offer it to any patient who has a history of missing appointments. I guess the theory is, if they keep blowing off their appointment, maybe if you pick them up, it'll increase the chance they get there, I suppose, okay? The next one, and if you're printed out your slides and uh, you're taking notes, circle the one that says eligible entity determines specific need criteria. So you could say everybody making X uh, and below we're going to offer it to, but not above. So circle that and then draw it to the big cannot base it on Medicare and Medicaid um, or other health care program status. Now, we could debate it. From a policy perspective, um, if somebody's on Medicaid, they've been screened, there's been you know, certain validation of their financial status, it would seem that saying we're going to do it for all Medicaid patients might be a logical thing to do, but the government has said, no, you can't do it here. Okay. Um, now, the last one, and if you remember the examples that Peter was, was bringing up, it's, it's a much more passive approach, but it's one that's kind of a classic which is the hospital says, listen, if somebody says to you, uh, you know, the receptionist they're speaking to or the person who's booking uh, the appointments, I have no way to get to the hospital. Ah, we have something that can help you. It's passive because it requires the patient to kind of initiate uh, what, they, what, they, um, what they need. Okay, but again, that will be the cheapest one, I think, because uh, how many people are, are going to do that? Okay. And actually, it would actually depend on where your hospital is too. An urban hospital might have more people that, that, that bring up that concern. Okay, now, the next one, again, remembering where Peter was, okay? You can't, just because you're, you know, in the safe harbor, it doesn't mean all bets are off. You cannot base it on, you cannot base the transportation of who you're going to offer it to in a manner that deter, that is volume or value-based. So, for example, you couldn't say, we're going to offer it to Dr. Bluestein because he has so many patients that come to our hospital. He'll love us and he'll keep sending us. But we're not going to offer it to Dr. Hoffman because he's not really sending us that many patients. That would violate the safe harbor. Okay, and you can't say anybody who submits at least any physician who submits at least a thousand patients a year they're going to be eligible, their patients are going to be eligible for transportation. Okay, you get the point. Remember, and if, and if what I'm about to say sounds like you've heard it before, that's because that's the history that, P, that Peter was talking about. You can't be picking people up in a luxury, interesting uh, vehicle, interesting question about what luxury is. We had a client where it was arguably luxury or not. It's not defined, but okay. You can't fly them places, um, and uh, you can't pick them up in an ambulance, okay? Uh, you can have a vehicle, and again, state law here is something that we're not going to get into, but, you know, if you're picking them up and you don't have any um, ability to deal with disabled people, wheelchairs, whatever, you could end up with a, with a separate issue. Um, public transportation is obviously fine. Um, somebody, you could actually, again, how broad this is, uh, if somebody says, hey, I took my own cab, here's my $20 receipt, you could actually pay them. We don't love that. We don't, just as a kind of a practice tip, we don't love, you know, cash going like that. We'd much rather you arrange for it. Um, uh, we can get, and we are going to get more into it, okay? Okay, the point of the safe harbor was not to allow a situation where you have these people locked in a cab and you can bombard them with advertisements. That's not what you're supposed to do. If you have, and I keep saying cabs, but we have some hospitals that are opting to have their own vehicles purchased and go to pick people up, uh, you could do that. And also the government is saying that you're allowed to have the name of the hospital on the vehicle. 
That is obviously a form of advertising. You could say, Andrew, you just said no advertising, but take what the government gives you. Okay? They actually think for safety it's important. Okay. Uh, and again, you can't bombard the people when they're sitting there uh, in your transportation vehicle. Okay? You can't pay drivers on a per beneficiary transport basis. Um, you know, there's, we all know those uh, bad examples where people were getting paid for everybody uh, they managed to bring to a provider. Okay. Now, um, remember we said that you can only make this available to established patients. Again, we know that that's a broad definition. Um, if the uh, entity, or the hospital in our case, is a provider, um, and the patient is going from their home to the hospital. You can't start picking them up, stopping off at the grocery because they want to get something before they come for their procedure, and then bring them back. And then when they're done, they say, you know what, I'd like to go to the movies, not to my home. That's not what this is about. Now, the shuttle service, which we're going to get to, will afford you some of those uh, flexibilities, but not this one. Okay. You also obviously can't say to a um, to a doctor, you know, we'll only do this if you use our hospital, okay? All right, now, we have not focused on local, which I think is really interesting, um, the way the government did this. <clears throat> if I said local, if I was thinking about it, I wouldn't have said 25 miles, but the government did. Actually, they went up to 50 miles if you're in a rural area, okay? But the most amazing thing about those two mileage is in the commentary, which measures it, and for the lawyers out there, you'll understand this, it's measured as the crow flies. So if you're in Manhattan on the east side and you're trying to get to Queens, you could drive up to, let's say, the 59th Street Bridge, come across, and you know that's gonna take you, you know, 20 miles, depending on where you are. If you're a crow, you can fly straight across the East River and boom, you're there, what's that, a mile and a half? So. We put this website in here. We don't own free maps. That's why they call it free map. But it's um, a way for you to take your hospital and see where 25 miles or 50 miles, depending on where you are. Okay, so let's have a little fun. Guess how far 25 miles is from the Empire State Building? So we did this map tool. And if you take a look at that circle, um, and let's say you were a hospital next to the Empire State Building, you could be going. Uh, you know, up to Tarrytown, you could be going well into New Jersey, Livingston. I mean, it's that's a huge circle. It's it's very dramatic. You go all the way out to Long Island. So um, I think, and the reason we put it here, not just because it's it's interesting, is because this is potentially going to make a much more competitive landscape because your catchment area just grew. Okay. I know we have people from uh, around uh, Albany and North, so we put 25 miles uh, from our office in Albany, and um, that goes to places I've quite frankly never heard of, but it's also extremely broad. Um, and if you're starting to get North, you may also be able to, to take advantage of the 50 mile. Um, New Jersey, okay? Here's 25 miles. Again, this is as the crow flies. It's not driving distance. So if you're saying to yourself, to go from Kingwood to Trenton is way more than 25 miles of a drive, that's right, because we're birds on this. Um, and you can see that this is huge. Okay, Connecticut, we didn't forget about you. We picked, we were going to do our Stanford office, but that would have been mostly pulling into New York. So we did it from the U.S. District Court in Hartford. And you see uh, also a very large swath of land where you could transport people. Okay. Now, a side note, um, but an important one, you can't be bringing people to the hospital, for example, because you're giving a lecture. Okay. Um, and it's, it's nice that people come uh, or to your gala. This has to be to obtain medically necessary services. Okay. All right, um, now, I said before we were going to come back to um, the cost shifting, okay? 
This is something your CFOs, if you're talking to them, are going to ask you. The transportation program drops directly to your bottom line. The reason for that is you can't put this in your cost report. You can't lay it off on anything else. So it's a dollar for dollar uh, uh, hit on your revenue. Whether you think it's necessary or not, based on what other people are doing or because you know you want to say, and by the way, it's up to 25 miles or 50 miles. You could draw it differently. We have one hospital that's considering only taking it from one borough because they've identified a problem with the transportation there. So you can do a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, whatever costs you do, they are going to, to hit you. Okay? All right. Now, remember I said there's two avenues. We've been talking about transportation for an individual. Now we're going to the next avenue. This is the shuttle service, okay, um, which can have some very uh, interesting PR uh, benefits, which we'll talk about in a second. Again, it's free or discounted by an eligible entity, that's the hospitals, in the form of a shuttle service. So what is uh, a shuttle service? So I'm going to give you an example, and then we'll look at, at, at the requirements. If you were coming out of Madison Square Garden, let's say after a game, and you had to get up to the east side of Manhattan, I'm picking on Manhattan because I assume everyone on this call has been to Manhattan at least once, um, you could see uh, ABC Hospital shuttle service. Say, oh, that's great. I don't have to necessarily pay for it. I'm not even a patient. But they're there because they're always there at 10 o'clock. So I jump on. It takes me... It's kind of like a bus. It takes me on different routes. I get off at my apartment on wherever. I never set foot in the hospital. That's okay. One of those stops has to be the hospital, but I don't even have to, I don't have to be a patient. I don't have to even take it there. It could be, I mean, when I come out of uh, the, uh, out of my procedure, let's say, and I'm ready to go home. Well, there's the shuttle. There's the sign telling me it's 10 minutes away. I look at the route. It'll take a little longer, but it's going to drop me a block from my house. I jump on it. Okay? That's a shuttle service. Let's look at the requirements. Again, it's what Peter was saying. It can't be air, luxury, or ambulance. We know that. And by the way, a lot of the, um, a lot of the requirements for the first road, the beneficiary transportation, is the same thing for shuttle. You can't mark it, except you could post the route information. You still have the same 25 or 50, and you can't shift the costs. Okay. But <clears throat> there are some differences between, between the two, okay? And one I've been harping on. It doesn't have to be for established patients. Now, if you're a hospital, let's say, very regional, and you want to promote some goodwill, so having your van going around with, yes, it has an advertising function, but to the extent that I can always jump on ABC um, a shuttle to go do my grocery shopping to come back, that's a goodwill thing. Uh, but it doesn't have to be for established patients. Okay. Now, the next difference, uh, it can be used for reasons other than to obtain healthcare items. So remember what I said before. Uh, um, you know, you want somebody to come to our lecture, they could do it, okay? Now, um, the OIG is not telling you, first of all, which avenue to pick. They're leaving it to you, which is something we find fascinating about the safe harbor. There's a lot of cre creativity. Um, and um, they're not telling you the stops. They're, they're, they're really leaving it to you. But at any time, any of those stops have to be within that 25 or, or 50 miles. Now, you also don't have to have a policy with the shuttle. Again, the compliance officers out there may not like that, and, and we say, we hear you. Okay, now, what are the next steps? Because we're looking, the questions are coming in, and uh, we want to get there, we're a little over. Okay, so what is the next thing you have to do? The first thing you have to do is really a strategic one. Do you want to do this or not? Do you want to provide free or discounted transportation? And we've been giving you a lot of 
things to think about, okay? So let's say you say, yes, we're going to do it. That leads to the next question, okay? Um, are you going to do the shuttle service route or are you going to do it to the individuals, okay? Remember, cost is going to potentially be a driver of that, okay? Um, what's the next thing you need to do? Uh, and our slides stop moving. Hold on. Okay. Um, how big a scope are you going to have here? What's, what are all the criteria? We gave you a lot of choice. Um, I had a hospital that they say, well, what should we do? If you want me to tell you, I can guess. But this has to be something that's really operationally decided. Um, how are you, are you going to hire your own uh, cab company to do it? Or are you going to um, get your own uh, vehicles? Now, something I, I want to just mention, um, some of these companies that are uh, taking people around, transportation companies, um, they are very, we're finding very uh, little liability protection. And I don't want to get into it now. There are some riders that you can get on your own policy to cover that, even though it's not yours. Um, but you need to be concerned about that because if they're taking your patients around and, God forbid, they crash, you know you're going to be involved in that lawsuit. Okay. you got to consider what other things you want to put into your safe harbor. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, into your policy. Once you have the policy, you must train the hospital personnel. Uh, and, by the way, shameless commercial, I know a great law firm that can help you train the hospital personnel. But it has to be done. Because you have a perfect policy and no one's following it, it's all messed up. We have done some of these trainings, and it's amazing what the what the you think you're saying one thing, but the questions really make you realize that they're thinking of something else. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. Um, if you're doing a, a shuttle services, remember it has to be local. Um, okay, uh, we talked about the fact that if you're doing well, we didn't talk about it. if you're doing it yourself, you're going to need certain commercial. Um, licenses that are not just anybody who can drive uh, and again the insurance we talked about okay so um, we're up to the questions and answers and I am going to shoot the first one um, at um, Peter um, <laughs> it says is uber or Lyft considered luxury knowing uber has multiple types of vehicles that's an excellent question Okay, so being on the spot here, I will I will confess that until recently I had never been in an Uber. I have two teenage daughters who live in Uber, um, so I'm a little hesitant on this one. The short answer is there's not a definition, I think as Andrew alluded to earlier, on luxury. I do understand that Uber has different types, Uber XL, Uber Standard. To the extent you get closer to a limousine type service, that would be prohibited. I would think that a standard Uber, to the extent it's much like a regular taxi, would be okay. Yeah, and I would say also that if you're using Uber, I mean, if the patient's using Uber and you're paying for it, I think you're going to want to limit it to the non-luxury uh, type of um, uh, transportation as a business matter. Okay, uh, next one. What definition of scheduling and what is I think what is the definition of scheduling an appointment? Could we transport patients home from the emergency department or inpatients after discharge? Okay, so the answer to that uh, goes back to the definition of an established patient. If a patient is in your hospital in the ED, they've obviously I don't know if they've scheduled, but they've attended an appointment. Um, and so they are an established patient of, uh, of you. And so depending on your policy, you could transport them home after discharge. If you wanted to transport them in accordance with their discharge plan to another provider, the issue that comes up is that the patient would need to be an established patient of that other provider meaning they would have to schedule an appointment with that other provider. Uh, and in addition, there's one thing that we didn't get into is if you are going to elect to transport patients um, to other providers rather than just to or from their home, 
Hospitals in particular have to be careful. You have to respect patient choice. So for instance, if you're going to transport a patient to a cardiologist on discharge, you can't say we're limiting your cardiology choice to those who are affiliated with our network. You have to make that transportation in that instance available to any cardiologist that the patient chooses. Now you can set up a policy that's limited on distance. So you can say we're only going to, as long as you're uniformly and consistently applying it, your policy can say we will transport to other providers only within 10 miles of the hospital, for instance. Okay. Um, okay. So, so let's, let's take the next one. What's the 50-mile rule for certain rural areas? So, Peter, you have that right there? Yeah, so that's an interesting question, and, and I'm going to apologize in advance because it's a bit of legal ease. Um, the way that um, uh, the government defines it in the safe harbor is they say, well, look, a rural area is defined as something that is not an urban area, okay? That's their words, not mine. But they do go on to very clearly specify what an urban area is. And urban areas are defined as metropolitan statistical areas or New England County metropolitan areas, which is not going to have too much relevance to those on the phone. Uh, and then a rural area is also, and again, I won't get into details on it, certain specified New England counties. So the, the bottom line is if you have that question, consult a good law firm, <laughs> some good lawyers, uh, and we can talk about where you're looking to go and how it fits in because there is a very particular uh, definition. Um, okay. Uh, the next question, we're, we're, we have two more minutes. The next question is a great question, um, which means we're probably going to think out loud. With regard to slide 25, what about individual physicians in an ACO with a hospital? Does the physician's office still need to incur some of the costs, or can the hospital incur all of the costs? Okay, so that's a good question as well, and the answer is going to lie, at least in part, in who is the eligible entity providing the transportation. What the safe harbor for individual patients says, remember we're, we've got two different components, is that it's the eligible entity who provides the transportation that has to bear the cost. So if the physician's office is providing the transportation, they have to bear the cost. If the hospital is providing the transportation, they have to bear the cost. If the ACO is making available to those within the organization, which is okay. Um, they are an eligible entity, uh, but they're not considered the eligible entity providing the transportation. So whomever they are helping out within the ACO, whether it's the hospital or the physician, that is the entity or individual that needs to bear the cost. It's a little bit confusing. It depends essentially on who is the provider of the transportation in that, in that question. So if you have a specific thing, that's going to be a case by case. The last question I want to hit is a great one because I don't know that we emphasize this enough. So here's the question to the audience. I'll read the question. You tell me what the answer is. Can a hospital put on its website that it offers free or discounted transportation? How would you guys answer that? Answer is you cannot do that. Um, and I, I think that people are going to end up doing that, and it's going to be great for the government because they're just sitting in their office in Washington or New York. They don't have to leave. They can just look at websites and see who's violating it. So anyway, okay, so it's now 1 o'clock. We thank you all very, very much uh, for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate the questions, and feel free to call us uh, with any uh, other questions that you have. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.